I see that uh, AI can help a lot in risk management. Firstly, if we think about the identification of risks. We tend to have sort of blind spots and we anchor our sort of risk identification to the first thoughts we have and humans can sort of brainstorm together issues. But what AI can do is sort of check if we have blind spots in our thinking. Are we comprehensive enough? Do we see the different corners in our own thinking? So you can sort of prompt the AI with your own human thinking and it will be giving you some sort of feedback on whether you, how you thought and how yeah. it would be thinking on top of your thinking. So I think that's certainly one, one topic. Do, do, have you seen sort of similar analogies in utilization of AI in, in more generic? I think in, in all topics it's always good to start sort of from a little bit higher level to yeah. think about what we really need to figure out and <coughs> yeah. for risk management the, the worst kind of incidents that can happen are the ones that surprise us and that we are completely unprepared for yeah and obviously risk management tries to make us prepared for what happens yeah. and for us to prepare we need to predict or identify the event yeah otherwise we can't prepare for it yeah so how do we do that? Why do we fail? And I think there are two categories where we fail. Yeah. The first one is these knowable unknowns. Uh, the, the idea is that it's unknown for us, therefore we fail to identify it and therefore we fail to prepare for it. But it's knowable, so we could have known it. Yeah. We just were lazy. We didn't look at the data, we didn't have the data, Good point. we didn't have the process to analyze the data. Yeah. There are some practical, pragmatic reasons why we failed. Yeah. And you can use AI in multiple ways to not fail in identifying the knowable unknowns. True. And I'd say that there are two categories, one of which is is some that people typically don't think about. And the, this one is, is where we can start to use new data sources. When people typically talk about AI, they, they think about training data. Yeah. But with large language models, for example, we can also talk about data that we ask the large language model to summarize, exactly. to, to analyze, to figure out risks in that material. Yeah. And there's so much data available that we can source or buy. Yeah. And just give you one example. Yeah. There are services where you can buy a lot of references to all media articles globally on topics that match your search criteria. So you could, for example, in a business, search for all media articles where your named customers are mentioned and some sort of a risk, incident, disaster, prediction, whatever keywords you can figure yeah. out are mentioned. And then it brings you thousands of articles. And then you can use a large language model to summarize, yeah. to analyze, to prioritize, yeah. And you can suddenly get an understanding of what kind of risks your customers face. And that will help you in your, your own risk management. Yeah. And maybe f help you figure out some of the unknowable, sorry, some, some of the knowable unknowns. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one example of, of where you can start using data that you didn't even think about. True. Because you understand that th there's just too much of it. You can't use it. True. But true. with AI, you can. Yeah, that's that's true. And also, many corporations they have databases that they don't use. For example, in risk management, they have hundreds of projects that have analyzed risks. Mm -hmm. and with, you have maybe some sort of taxonomies. But the future project don't use that data um, because it would be burdensome to sort of harmonize and categorize and do the taxonomies. Mm -hmm. And before you couldn't utilize the data, but now the AI allows you to use also sort of very sort of uh, rigid databases and sort of uh, uh, libraries uh, that is controlled by the organization itself. So it doesn't use then the open data, data corpus, for example, of open AI. It's, it's controlling 
control and also using only the library of the corporation yeah. to prompt uh, the suggestions and generate suggestions from the database of the corporation itself. Yeah. And that allows that you can use AI also in a controlled manner, in, in a sense. And the data is not even actually used to teach the AI uh, further, mm -hmm. so it's completely con controlled. And another, another thing that, uh, that we've done is to help in risk mitigation. Sometimes you have risks that you don't necessarily know what to do about them, uh, or you don't exactly know what would be a robust enough list of actions to actually mitigate properly that mm -hmm. risk. And the AI can suggest you uh, uh, sort of risk mitigation actions. And sometimes the, the mitigation action proposals by the AI are a little bit sort of self-evident in the sense that it's sort of matching language models, not necessarily utilizing risk management data. It can use, but if you use it as a sort of basic open language model, uh, still the, the sort of self-evident proposals can be very important mm -hmm. to implement. So it's sort of a quality assurance or third opinion sort of that you could check. Uh, and of course, not necessarily always relying on AI. And, and one, one element uh, that we've also thought about quite a bit is when to use AI. Do you ask the humans to think about risk topics first and then utilize AI to generate further? Or do you start with AI? You can do, of course, both, but you have to think about the implications for the human thinking in that mm. process, sort of. Mm -hmm. I think you brought up a very important point where I started thinking about unutilized data sources that the company has not even paid attention to before because they know that they can't use it. You brought up the point that the companies have lots of data that they are underutilizing themselves, yeah. their own data. Yeah. And that's a very important, of, of course, we should first use that data that we own ourselves and that is, is directly relevant to our business. But yeah. then there's so much more out there. Yeah. And we can, we can really do a huge amount in, in improving the quality of our risk analysis. True. And then risk mitigation, of course, is, is maybe something where we humans are a little bit better. If we are told what the risk is, we can figure out what to do about it. It becomes a project. Yeah. But figuring out what the both the, the knowable unknowns as well as the unknowable unknowns yeah. are is the, the challenge. And for unknowable unknowns, which you sort of have no way of figuring out in advance, yeah. you still can prepare by making sure that you are agile. Yeah. I, you get surprised, but then you react quickly. Exactly. And that's another muscle that you can train. Yeah. And you can figure out processes and tools, and AI being one of them, yeah. which when something happens will help you figure out what to do. Yeah. And actually, AI can also support sort of scenario building, which is basically preparing for unknown unknowns. Exactly. In the sense that, uh, that we can create uh, alternative futures which are not exactly realizing as they are described. Yeah. But the AI can produce real enough future outlooks and summaries that you can quickly then utilize for your scenario yeah. processes. And one of the challenges before was in scenario processes and, and planning in more general was to build the scenarios to think about the implications and impact for us. And many organizations didn't have that resource or the inclination, expertise, focus or time to mm -hmm. build scenarios. Now you can use AI to build the scenarios and then you can think about the impact for yourself and the sort of mitigation preparedness plans for those scenarios as well as thinking about the opportunities of course mm -hmm. in those scenarios. So I think that's a truly groundbreaking when it comes to sort of scenario thinking more widely. Yeah. Yeah. Scenario planning is a good way to create agility because mm. then you're mentally preparing for things that you you don't know about. Yeah. You identify various scenarios and it's unlikely that one of those would happen exactly but something will happen that maybe is a combination of two of those scenarios or somewhere in between the yeah. scenarios and then you are more agile in your response. Yeah, absolutely. And what AI does well is also breaking down scenarios as indicators. So you can then monitor mm -hmm. which of these scenarios are starting to realize. Yeah. And usually the reality is a mixture of multiple scenarios happening at the same time. 
if they are sort of not mutually exclusive scenarios. You can then get into the sort of most likely scenario, which, which wasn't any of those scenarios that you laid out, but it's a mixture of them, mm -hmm. adding maybe some new uh, trigger events or some sort of indicators and drivers into it. And then you get closer to the where we are actually going. Uh, and that's also one, one sort of powerful utilization of AI. So we have now discussed AI in risk management, but there's a fascinating topic of, of risk management in AI. True. Because AI is a, is a very multifaceted topic, True. and it's technologically in an unknown space, mm. or it's sort of an unknowable. True. In, in a way, because unknown, we, we don't really well. understand True. what is happening. And the most fascinating aspect of this is emergent capabilities, mm. which basically means that we are building a machine learning system, we're training it for a particular purpose, and it learns something completely different, mm. which we didn't uh, yeah. predict. We couldn't expect it to learn that, but it learns. Yeah. For example, the large language models where the system actually only does one thing. It predicts the next next word. Mm -hmm. It knows, sort of, if, if you're writing a story, it knows all the previous words. It knows the topic that it's given, maybe some background data, and then starts to create just words. Mm -hmm. And it predicts what the next word should be. Mm -hmm. And how does, how can this learn to do math? Mm. But as People were building larger and larger, large language models. Mm -hmm. At one stage, it started to become pretty good in math. Mm -hmm. And then we did one step bigger, LLM, and it became better at mm -hmm. math. And it's very hard to understand, even after observing this capability, yeah. how did it learn that? Because it, it is not a statistical capability. Mm -hmm. Predicting the next word is, is sort of a statistical capability. Yeah, true. You have read everything that is on the internet, basically, and you statistically know that if these were the 100 previous words, you understand the topic, you understand the actors, you understand what the topic is, you can predict the next word. Yeah. But in math, it, it doesn't really it doesn't work, like, work that. like that. Yeah. It is more complicated. True. Well, we combine sort of quantitative and qualitative AI summaries is now that we can sort of uh, make the quantitative assessments of multiple people as text or written language. So somebody rates something as moderate uh, uh, on impact, three maybe uh, very likely, four mm -hmm. against five in, in likelihood. And then we give the AI that as a language and then it also summarized the sort of uh, it doesn't exactly do any math there, but at least sort of summarizes how critical people saw certain risks based on also the numerical assessments, and then it matches that with the comments and, and mitigation suggestions and provides very neat executive summaries of mm -hmm. that risk, risk input, which used to take a lot of time from people to analyze what sure. people think about risk. That, that's one opportunity, but talking about the risks in AI and risks in AI in use of risk management uh, in particular, one risk is that we don't know exactly what the AI should have produced us if we used in a generative way. Uh, therefore, if some malicious actor would do a cyber attack and corrupt the data or the model yeah. somehow in between, the data would be biased by a human without us knowing it in terms of what the AI pro pro proposes to us. Or maybe not biased, but it would just be false. False, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly false. Uh, and, and, and sort of corrupting the data, that's actually one challenge because we didn't know what the, it should have been yeah. in the first place. But sort of these risks of bias, mm. they are well known and we have been talking about them for at least 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. But the, the risk that I, I started talking about these emergent capabilities, think about a, a system that has various interfaces to the real world, i.e. the system steers industrial processes, traffic lights, security, yeah. airports, 
maybe even all of these. Yeah. Maybe there's a city AI that controls many systems in a city. And that AI creates capabilities that it was not trained for. Mm -hmm. And the AI has a, a goal function in a way, and it tries to achieve that goal, not just using the capabilities that it was trained for, but maybe using some other capabilities that we don't even know it has. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then true. this combination may lead to some really scary Very. outcomes. Yeah. And this is of course a bit of a science fiction yeah. thing, but we need to we need to prepare for this yeah. so that we are not surprised if it happens. Yeah. And we need to make sure that we have the tools to react if it happens. Yeah. If an AI goes really haywire. True. How do we how do we do an emergency shutdown without risking people's lives when all the traffic lights start to blink yellow? Yeah. And and the factory does an emergency shutdown yeah. and maybe something blows up because it was not designed to do it like exactly. that. Exactly. So in this way risk management in AI and AI in risk management yeah. come together. Yeah, uh, well true actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And one one concern that I have sort of on top of the development of the super intelligence or general AI that we lose control over, which can happen in five years or ten years, in a sense is, is also the humans utilizing AI in malicious ways, mm -hmm. uh, sort of that that also and that's already happening. Yeah, that's actually I would want to ask from you as the founder of WitSecure, and you have been doing decades on, on, on sort of cyber security, trying to outsmart the hackers mm -hmm. and the sort of cycle that there's no sort of better solution for a bad uh, person with bad AI than the person with good AI, that you have to understand where the deal goes. But then it turns out into a sort of vicious cycle that the AIs get smarter and smarter. Isn't that a little bit similar than in, in cybersecurity uh, more widely, that you always have mm -hmm. to sort of keep up with the, with the pace of the malicious actors? Yeah. At the, uh, it yeah. is exactly like that. It yeah. has been for forever. Yeah. And AI is just a new phase in that. Yeah. And as you pointed out, the, the possibility of the malicious actors utilizing AI-based attack tools yeah. will make these attacks much faster. Yeah. And therefore, a human on the defensive side will not be able to react. Yeah. So we need to have automatic systems reacting. Yeah. And therefore, we need defensive AI-based systems. And it will be an offensive, defensive AIs battling together. Yeah. And how do you then put the human into the chain in such a way that the human is in control and understands what's happening and can guide the AI if, some, if things happen in milliseconds? Mm. Because the traditional sort of professional hacker, mm. what we talk about hands-on keyboard hacking, yeah which is what the professionals do. Yeah. It's a little bit like you break into a house at night. Yeah. So you open a window and you go in and you don't see anything. It's dark. And you don't dare switch on the light because then you become visible. Mm. So you just sort of feel your way around very carefully so that you don't make noise, you don't create light. And this is what the hacker does. They get access to a device in the company's networks or systems, but they don't know which device they got access to. Yeah. They don't know what else is in that device, what yeah. access rights the user or the process that they have gained access to has. Yeah. And they know that if they sort of do fast or take action that is too visible, then they will be found out. So they need to move very slowly. But AI could do that very quickly, sort of mm. move slowly and carefully, mm. but because the AI does things in, in milliseconds, the outcome is very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's a completely new paradigm in, in cybersecurity. Sounds challenging. challenging you know, yeah. But it's still the same old mm. new technologies Technology. on one yeah. side, 
we true. need to respond. True, true, true. Yeah, one, one of the risks also in, in utilizing AI is to sort of uh, uh, thinking about the, how, how it can sort of make human biases worse. So that because we have all of these different biases that we we tend to mirror the information mm -hmm. that we get or we want to reinforce the information that we get to anchor to the information. Uh, so how do we interact with AI while maintaining our own own thinking process intact or, or the integrity of our own thinking process and rather stimulate and enhance the human thinking with AI rather than diminishing it? Mm -hmm. That's also one, it's a risk and an opportunity, but, but also maybe something that we haven't answered in all applications yet, how it will affect human thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but think about if, let's say you are a corporate executive and you're using an AI-based system for thinking about strategy. Yeah. And you're worried that the, the AI will be biased in some way or it will just end up suggesting something bad. How about if you have have another AI system, a standalone separate system mm. that tries to figure out weaknesses, maybe do a SWOT analysis mm. of what the first AI proposes. Mm. It's like you're having two experts next to you. Yeah. Both of them have read all the material in the world yeah. and they comprehend all that material and and they balance each other out. So you can get two opinions, one of which is, is an analysis of the first. Mm -hmm. I think we will see many instances where we'll have two AI systems, the second one sort of observing and anal analyzing the actions of the first one. True. And maybe it's the human who gets that benefit Maybe That's it's just that the city AI that I talked about. Yeah, we would have another AI system that has to approve every action that the first one proposes. That's, a, that's an interesting. And the second AI is trained to identify threats and weaknesses. Mm. That's a great idea. And humans then start think themselves if they can get the one opinion and then the second opinion on that, or maybe third and fourth then you have to take your own stance into it somehow. And it teaches you to think critically. Yeah. Because when you see that, okay, this, this second opinion that you get into a sidebar on your screen, yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. That, that was a completely new thought for me. And then it trains your brains. Okay, last time I didn't figure out the weakness. Now I need to sort of be more creative and focused and smart. Yeah for the next thing that, that, that I'm analyzing or looking at. True. One more, one more sort of a thought that I, that I have is, is sort of a, to utilize the power of the sort of machine learning uh, uh, sort of uh, algorithms and the, the whole neuro, neuro uh, uh, sort of model uh, in, in language models, for example, but with controlled data sets. Uh, and, and one, one thing is that, uh, or one critique of AI is, is that you're not exactly sure uh, what it produces based on what data, uh, wh how it uh, comes. Are you it. sure about what your colleagues produce, what humans produce? <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but how you could use AI in, in sort of a, uh, in a, in a solid, solid way is that you, you, you give the give a data set, for example, 100 projects that have done their own risk management, and each of the pro projects had some sort of risk profile based on the human evaluation. And certain set of those risks actually realized. And then you can know how well the humans assess those mm -hmm. risks based on the outcome of that project risk assessment. Uh, but no humans can sort of uh, go through all of that data and understand which of these risks are actually realizing in all of the projects. So what the AI can do is to, to explain you which, which risk in the, in the 101st project you have neglected and of those risks that you have identified how realistic they are actually to realize mm -hmm. based on the previous projects. Uh, uh, so when uh, are you yeah. going to have this functionality in, in Inclus? Soon, yeah, we are working uh, on, on mm -hmm. more and more on the predictive uh, models. So now we can do 
identification of risks in, a, in many ways, also in scenario planning, uh, uh, sort of identifying developing scenarios. We can uh, uh, also summarize a lot of data, quantitative and qualitative data, to be uh, handled in an efficient and, and sort of a reliable manner. We can also look at the quantitative results, uh, what are the biggest deviations, what are the uh, sort of biggest uh, uncertainties within the risk management. And we can generate also mitigation actions on, on risk that you have identified. Mm -hmm. uh, and and now, now what we are also doing that we have clients' data sets that we teach the AI to use primary, mm -hmm. primarily before the sort of open data corpus, mm -hmm. that they can then utilize their, their own libraries. And more and more when the libraries are, are sort of uh, built based on the lessons learned data and actual realized risks, then you already get the sort of predictive uh, uh, idea there. But you need, of course, then to have good data sets and, and more and more we can produce those. Uh, but we are looking into also to sort the of horizon scanning type of approach that you described earlier, how we can generate from the timely data from the internet to identify sort of time risks or risks based on, on a certain industry or sector. What are the most prevalent uh, supply uh, risks, for example, in South Africa on mm. certain materials, mm. etc. So we are getting to more and more predictive real time uh, uh, utilizing the external data sources, but also the internal data sources. So every day it's actually advancing. Mm. We are working heavily on, on these, these topics. Yeah, now we have observed two, two human language models predicting the next word based on the previous words. But we talked about LLMs earlier. It's exactly what we have been doing now. True. As we start speaking, we don't know how the sentence will finish. True. We just figure out what's the next word that I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's exactly the same that LLMs do. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. Sometimes I also feel like that I speak before I think so. <laughs> but you, you do have to think about what the word that you are saying right now. But you don't know what the word after that will be. <laughs> yes. Exactly. exactly. Good point. Yeah, that's nice. Every time there's a new fundamental technology, it's of course a big opportunity. But to grasp that opportunity, we need to educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So AI definitely is a topic that all executives and basically everybody should try to understand a little bit better. Mm. If we all become a little bit better in understanding it, the cumulative effect can be very, very positive. We don't need to become programmers or experts, but understand the strengths and weaknesses of these systems how to apply them, learn from each other. But then, of course, fundamentally, AI will just be embedded in every single information management system, software application that is out there. Mm. And we will be using AI capabilities without even knowing they are there. Mm. And Inclus, I think, is a great example. It yeah. will have lots of features that will guide, that will suggest, that will predict, that will analyze True. That will help the system to apply its expertise in the customer's data sets, mm -hmm. in the customer's environment, in their business. Yeah. And that's a major way of gaining the benefits without actually mm. knowing or focusing on the fact that you are using AI. True. In Inclus, we always uh, give the uh, user the, the permission to use AI or give the AI permission to propose solutions. So you can sort of control, of course, in our solution how much or in what components of the risk management process you, you want to use AI on. And, and we primarily uh, sort of suggest for our users to to ensure that the human process is, 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 is of high, high quality and, and well thought through and then the AI can be used uh, with certain certain recommendations on on how you sort of on top of the human process uh, utilize the AI, but there also the user needs to understand how do you prompt the AI to provide you good results, mm. and that's a competence area in itself actually. It is. 
So, so therefore, it, it's it's almost mandatory for for any expert nowadays to mm. get on the wagon. Yeah, it's interesting that if you tell a large language model as part of the prompt, for example, that you are an expert in this topic and you are extremely careful in double checking all the data sources mm. that you use, it will affect how the large language model does its work or produces its output. So it's a little bit like talking to a child or yeah. a I don't know, a human being. Yeah. That hey, now I want you to yeah. help me yeah. in this, but I want you to approach this as an expert would. Yeah. So That's don't rush, point. don't don't be careless. Think twice. And it will affect how you do it. Yeah, true. And the large language model is similar. But what we talked earlier is how would a sort of a lay person use AI, study it a little bit, try to understand the strengths and weaknesses and use systems that have embedded AI. Yeah. But then for somebody who is a, let's say, a IT professional, not a programmer, but understands a little bit more, mm. you can start doing so much more. Like many of us have been in the situation where we have wanted to do some sort of, let's say, business analysis that would be based on multiple data sets from the company, and it has been impossible. Mm. The data is not available, or yeah, the, the IT department has this in the backlog, but it, we don't have resources to do it. And what you can do now is take chat GPT, for example, tell it that have this problem, I have data in these formats, how would I combine these data sources in Python and produce this type of an outcome. And ChatGPT will write you the code mm. to do that. Like one example that a friend of mine did, he had never written Google script. And the company uses Google environment. So for example, Google's calendar. And Google Script can pull information from everybody's calendars. And the, the guy just said that, how would I oh, write me a Google Script that will pull information from everybody's calendars on business meetings and produce me a graph on how many customer meetings we have had each week for the last 52 weeks. And it's there. And then you can run it and you get the outcome. And this is something that would have taken a human programmer quite a lot of time to understand what the executive wants, write the code, test it, maybe study Google Script because the human being would have never written Google Scripts before either. Yeah. And now you can get it in 10 minutes. True. Maybe it doesn't work fully, but if you are a little bit capable, you can debug it yourself and in a day or two you have a functional program. Yeah. And this is a big opportunity for not the real experts but sort of the, the middle level mm. experts which I think for example both of us mm. are. Mm. So we can do things that we were never able to do before. True, true. Yeah, and systematize and program things that we wouldn't have necessarily resources or time to time to actually do. Yeah, we would have needed somebody else to do it for True. us. Now we can do it ourselves. True. And even the sort of expert developers in our company are using AI in sort of building the code 80% through and then finishing the 20% yeah. off or then producing 80% yourself, then quality assurance with the AI and, and so on. So it will make the process much more efficient. And that's also one of the dangers of AI, that if, when we have now taught it to code, it really then can code. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the auto control factor, that what will it code and where and, uh, you know, on what and what, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's one of the big questions as well. And uh, then again, we can have another AI yeah. that will read the code and tell us what it does. Mm. And then we can read the description of what the code does and compare it to what we wanted it to do. Yeah. Or we can ask the other AI to look for weaknesses or 
bugs or security issues exactly. in the in the first code. Yeah. And the second one can be trained to identify exactly those, so it can be True. a real expert True. in that. So as we talked earlier, having two AIs sort of checking each other and yeah. making sure that the quality assurance is high level. That's, that's interesting.